they say knowledge is power, and this is seldom more true than in war. To know your enemy's plans and deny them the same privilege is to stack odds in your favor. Military cryptography has a history as long as any signal core, from the simple ciphers used by the ancients to more complex electromechanical devices of the 20th century. One such machine was the German Enigma. It resembles an over-engineered typewriter, but the encryption it provided for the Nazis proved tough to break. Plain text is passed through a scrambled pathway, a series of rotors set to a secret configuration each day. Orders, locations or mission details could all be safely transmitted over radio with no fear of interception. Without knowing the machine's state, translating a coded message back into a readable form would have been almost impossible. Almost. Its complexity was such that mere manpower could not solve it within any reasonable time. To crack the code would require a mechanical mind instead. The first successes in cracking Enigma belonged to the Polish Cypher Bureau, but much of the wartime glory is attributed to one man. The brilliant mind of Alan Turing. Known for his pioneering work in the emerging field of computer science, he found himself at Britain's code-breaking centre at Bletchley Park. It was here that he and his team achieved the impossible. A machine was made that could unravel the German ciphers, leaving their private plans laid bare. No doubt, the effort spent breaking Enigma saved lives and shortened the war. A secret success that shaped the Allied victory. The world would never be quite the same after 1945, Nuclear punctuation marked the start of the modern age. The computer's role in war had only just begun. Many of us have grown up with video games. But video games grew up during the Cold War. This is a story about how the modern age took shape and how new technology and political tension gave rise to the games we play today. From mechanical mines to the pursuit of other worlds, huge nuclear arsenals and their alarming potential. Video games and war have more in common than you think. The aftermath of World War II saw Europe in ruins and two new superpowers emerged in the stead of the old the Soviet Union and the United States. Former allies left standing in a divided world, rife with paranoia and espionage. An inevitable struggle for power had just begun. Having proven their wartime worth, computers found their way into an academic setting. Governments were keen to invest in technology, lest they be left behind. Turing's work on Enigma was shrouded in secrecy, and so he quietly resumed his role in computing research. With no codes left to break, he instead sought an answer to a question that has dogged the minds of philosophers and engineers alike. Can machines think? Turing's approach to artificial intelligence was a pragmatic one. A convincing opponent need not think like a human, only behave like one. He devised a method to evaluate AI ability. A blind test in which a neutral party poses questions to both a computer and human participant in an attempt to discern which is which. He called it an imitation game, but we know it better as the Turing test. The game a veil between machine and mind. The Mechanical Turk was a marvel of a machine built by Hungarian engineer Baron Wolfgang von Kempelen. A formidable opponent, this metal man best flesh with a clockwork efficiency. It was all a fake, of course, but the idea of an automaton opponent, a thinking machine, was fascinating. Artificial intelligence is a natural application for a game like chess. 
albeit a very challenging one. Simulating a chess board is easy. 64 squares, 32 pieces, 16 for each of the two players. Implementing the rules is a little trickier, but still feasible on early machines. Grids and rules are concrete, logical, a natural fit for a computer's memory. More difficult is a simulation of not just the game board, but an opponent. The game grows in complexity as it's played. Decisions, strategy, hundreds of possible moves compound into trillions in just a few turns. The first chess playing programs appeared in an academic setting. Alan Turing wrote one during his time at the University of Manchester. Dubbed TurboChamp, it started life as an algorithm without a computer, a theoretical implementation only, but a working one nonetheless. In 1951, Christopher Strachey developed a program to play the simpler game of drafts, and Dietrich Prinz implemented a practical chess algorithm that could solve mate in two problems. Computers of this era were slow, taking minutes or hours to deliberate all available permutations. But these early programs sowed the seed for later AI routines, including those that found their way into video games. Hunt the Wumpus was originally written in the basic programming language in 1972, and was later adapted for a number of other platforms. The premise is straightforward. You are in a labyrinth comprising multiple chambers, one of which is occupied by a monster. As the title of the game implies, you must navigate the maze, avoiding hazards such as bottomless pits and bats, and hunt the wampus. The catch is that you must do it by smell alone. If you stumble into the monster, it's game over. Instead, you must fire your arrows blindly into an adjacent chamber. If you strike the beast, you win. But if you don't, the Wumpus will move. A very simple program, but from its few lines of code, emerge a virtual adversary. Governed by simple rules, yet affording an interesting challenge to the player. The 1980s Pac-Man was a hugely popular arcade title, and much of its appeal stems from its character. The yellow circle section was the star, but the four ghosts who chase him were each given names and a different behaviour. All operate under three different modes. Chase, Scatter, and Frightened. The latter limited to a brief duration after a power pill is collected. Scatter mode sends each of the ghosts to a separate corner, and occurs at preset times during a level. By default, the ghosts will chase Pac-Man. And it's this mode, where the individual AI routines start to make the game interesting. The Red Ghost, also known as Blinky, is the most aggressive, making a beeline directly for Pac-Man's position, and speeding up as dots are consumed. Pinky attempts to ambush the player, targeting the position four squares ahead of Pac-Man's direction of travel. Light Blue Ghost Inky has the most complex targeting, seeking the tile opposite the Red Ghost's position relative to Pac-Man, effectively a pincer manoeuvre designed to trap the player. Finally, the Orange Ghost Clyde will target Pac-Man directly, until he gets too close in which case he'll retreat to his maze corner instead. These four independent AIs give each of the ghosts their own behaviour, and by extension, their own personality. Today, computer opponents are a little more developed. Far from perfect, but still capable of some surprisingly human manoeuvres. They perform best in games with a rigid rule set with discrete turns. Scaling from the simplest, such as the perfectly solved tic-tac-toe, to the greater scope of grand strategy games. A computer opponent can prove formidable to play against, but a human player can exploit an AI player's predictability to their own advantage. 
Some games feature more adaptive intelligence, shaping their own algorithms based on previous input, allowing for growth over time and the potential to overcome previously failed objectives. However, such techniques are difficult to implement and come with potentially unwanted side effects. There's nothing worse than a neurotic machine. Years and years of Similarly challenging is parsing natural language. Computers struggle to understand English, much less compose a cogent response. This is fatally apparent in early text adventures. Only a sanctioned list of keywords are permitted, and attempting to interact with characters in any way outside these bounds is often met with disappointment. Real-time decision-making is an essential part of first-person shooters, with reactive enemies more satisfying to kill than static targets. Smaller touches, like when the monsters fight each other in Doom, can be quite effective. A reaction to unexpected circumstances and a break from relentlessly targeting the player. The radio chatter of the enemy soldiers in Half-Life gives an insight into their mind. And while such a stream of consciousness isn't entirely realistic, it is nonetheless satisfying to hear their panic when you toss a grenade in their direction. Like Pac-Man's ghosts, diversity in the enemies you face can make for more interesting battles. The varied makeup of the Covenant in Halo helps communicate expected behavior. The smaller grunts are tough in larger groups when led by an elite, but decapitate their command and they'll disperse, rendering them less effective. Even the Star War elites can be broken. Get too close and they might reposition, a contrast to the relentless assault more mindless enemies might offer. AI remains an emerging field, and there are many challenges left to overcome. But within the context of games, the ability to provide a simple opponent is very valuable. The best AI is invisible. The illusion of intelligence only breaks down when an opponent does something stupid. Without it, single-player games would be a hollow experience. No challenge, no surprise. No real opposition. Silicon vs. Flesh, Man vs. Machine In 1997, IBM's Deep Blue, a supercomputer, was able to best chess grandmaster Garry Kasparov. This was the first time a world champion was defeated by a computer under regular time restraint. And it wouldn't be the last. Upon its victory, Deep Blue ranked upon the fastest machines on the planet. But today, you can find a similar amount of number-crunching power in your pocket. With the right application, artificial intelligence is smart. And it's only going to get smarter. The impact of the work Turing did cannot be understated. He defined the very essence of computing, considered how they might think, and proved their military worth. His death? A tragedy. His treatment? An embarrassment. As one war ended, another began. A power vacuum fueled by paranoia, two nations found themselves perpendicular. American individualism versus Soviet collectivism. Blue versus red. Us versus them. Post-war America was peaceful. A strong economy festooned in more modern conveniences than ever before. An endless summer captured in Kodachrome beauty. Space travel was the reserve of sci-fi idle dreams of distant worlds. Project Vanguard was the closest America had to a space program, tasked with getting a satellite in orbit. Its schedule was relatively unhurried, until a rude awakening. 
the starting pistol of the space age had a strange report, commencing not with a bang, but with a beep. In October 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1 into orbit, the very first artificial satellite. It wasn't much to look at, a silver sphere with four trailing antenna, a little over half a meter in diameter, but it was the first man-made object to pierce the sky. If anyone had any doubts about Soviet capability, the evidence was overhead. Its radio transmitter emitted a steady beep as it orbited the Earth. A simple message broadcast to all. The space race had begun. The Sputnik crisis triggered a massive technology investment within America, ordained by President Eisenhower. Science budgets bloomed and new initiatives were born, such as the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, who would later be responsible for the precursor to the internet. The same year, space agency NASA was founded with one simple mission to wrest space superiority from the Soviets. The Reds' momentum carried them to a number of space firsts. Laika in 1957, the first dog in orbit. Luna 2 in 1959, the first spacecraft to reach the moon. And 1961, Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. A final goal line was drawn, one that would prove the culmination of the space age, proposed in JFK's 1962 speech. We choose to go to the moon. American progress kicked into a high gear. Billions of dollars poured into education and no expense spared on technology. Computers were now an essential part of academia and a new generation of programmers could get to grips with these machines. Many early games spawned in an academic setting, a fertile mix of bright mind and accessible hardware. Space War was a product of this hacker culture at MIT in 1962. A two-player game played on the circular CRT display of a DEC PDP-1 a minicomputer which cost the equivalent of nearly one million dollars today. Its gameplay was simple. Two ships, the needle and the wedge, embroiled in a space dogfight. A star in the centre of the display complicates things, with its gravitational pull altering the trajectory of anything passing nearby. Avoid crashing into the star, projectiles or your opponent and land a successful shot to win. Space War was an on-campus hit, proving popular with those able to play it. But the high cost of the hardware prohibited any commercial exploitation. Nevertheless, the game was particularly influential, a prototype for future arcade games. Meanwhile, time was ticking. The Apollo project's first launch was in 1966, testing the Saturn rocket needed for a lunar mission. 1968, Apollo 7, the first manned test of the platform. Apollo 8, the first manned flight to the moon. Every mission a step closer to the goal. Every delay, an invitation for the Soviets to slip ahead. July 1969, Apollo 11. After years of planning, it was time to shoot for the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In 1950, 9% of American homes had a television. By 1962, it was 90%. A rapid transformation from rare luxury to true mass media. An estimated half a billion people worldwide witnessed the moon landings live. 14% of the world's population at the time. Space 
was firmly lodged in the public consciousness. It was around this time that the very first coin-operated arcade machines began to appear. A chance to take video games outside their academic setting and rake in a few coins in the process. The first was a game from Stanford University named Galaxy Game. A clone of the earlier Space War running on a PDP-1120 minicomputer. It was popular, but with only one machine, its impact was limited. A mass-produced game was needed. Computer Space was the first. Yet another version of Space War brought to market by Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney. Some 1,500 units were sold, although Computer Space proved too complex to be a real commercial success. While the general public might have been fascinated with new technology, few had any experience with video games. Bushnell and Dabney's next game in 1972 would fare much better, as would their company, Atari. Pong is a definitive video game, the first to really break into public view, and proof that there was a market for this new form of entertainment. It wasn't space-themed, but it was definitely space-age. And by emulating a familiar sport, Pong was far more accessible than any other video game that came before. Its instructions were distilled into three simple lines. Deposit quarter. Ball will serve automatically. Avoid missing ball for high score. Around 35,000 arcade units were sold with countless more clones, and home console versions designed for domestic televisions sold by the hundreds of thousands. Atari became a household name, and video games a permanent cultural artefact. As arcades started to flourish, this space-age sentiment was perfectly encapsulated on film by the 1977 release of Star Wars a translation of the recent space mania into a fictional realm, and a runaway success that shaped pop culture for years to come. This renewed interest in sci-fi sparked a golden age of the arcade, with more advanced hardware offering a wider variety of games. Space or sci-fi themed cabinets were incredibly popular early on with games like 1978's Space Invaders, an alternative amongst dwindling interest in Pong clones. Space shoot-em-ups were the next big thing, the empty background of space perfect for the Spartan graphics of the age, and with high score-led single-player gameplay. Asteroids, Lunar Lander, Galaxian, Defender, these games defined the golden age of the arcades. A heady space-age mix of an Apollo afterglow and Star Wars fantasy. Space will forever remain a part of gaming's roots. Exploration is a major theme of space games. A satisfaction of the desire to travel to worlds beyond our own and a bridge to span the seemingly insurmountable gap between the stars. Elite from 1984 is the perfect example of the sort of freedom such a game can offer. It kick-started the space trader genre. Just you, your ship, and a cargo bay full of interstellar profit. A chance to retell tales of pirates on a new frontier. And a surprisingly comfortable seat at the helm of your craft. Some titles seek to inspire the same sense of drama and danger of the real space race. Games like Buzz Aldrin's Race into Space serve as an educational means to convey the difficulties of a lunar landing. Even the light-hearted challenge of running your own Kerbal space program is fraught with danger. The cold vacuum of the cosmos is an unforgiving place. Simply reaching outer space is one challenge. To forge a world anew is another entirely. The colonization of space is a common sci-fi extension of strategy games. 
what better place to explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate? A chance to fix the faults of the old world, but all the violent baggage that mankind insists on carrying leads to an inevitable descent into space war. A longing for an investment lost. A chance to imagine humanity free from its cradle, free from petty dispute, but fraught with challenge anew. Even after all these years, there's something magical about space. A certain hope, an aspiration for the future, a transcendental leap to a new era for mankind. We might have been born too early to explore the universe, but we can still dream. The pursuit of space is a noble goal. It grants new technology, a greater understanding of our universe, and a chance to extend our reach to the stars. However, a more insidious side of humanity lurks in the shadows of progress. The embodiment of war, and a currency of peace. Nuclear weapons unlock the explosive power of the atom, pound for pound, a potential a million times greater than TNT. A destructive force that can strike terror into even the most powerful nation. A secret struggle for superiority, which would define the decades ahead. The first nuclear weapons were designed to be delivered by aircraft, by dropping the payload directly on the target. A B-29 Superfortress named Enola Gay embarked on an historical mission. The first atomic bomb used in war. 1945, Hiroshima. It's hard to keep something so loud a secret, and so America's time as sole nuclear power was short. The Soviets tested their first lightning in 1949. In the standoff that followed, strategic bombers were the agents of destruction. Massive, long-range craft like the Tupolev Tu-95 and B-52 Stratofortress, bearing the fate of the world on their frame. Aircraft were the most visible aspect of the tensions between two nations, and the missions flown the closest approach to conventional war. It wasn't just bombers. Cold War skies saw a menagerie of exotic birds, in tentative sorties of all kinds. From spy planes like the U-2 and SR-71 Blackbird, to scrambled air superiority fighters. Flight simulators have long been used to train pilots, with scale simulacra far less expensive than risking a real plane. Amateur flight simulations made an appearance shortly after the rise of the 8-bit home machines, with aeronautical enthusiasts seeking to emulate the thrill of aerial combat. They vary in realism, with some titles taking authenticity very seriously, and others seeking simpler, action-centric gameplay. The Soviet MiG-31 caused quite a stir in the West in the late 70s, with claims of a new superfighter, faster than anything else and capable of intercepting cruise missiles. This panic was reflected in 1982 film Firefox, along with its tie-in game on Laserdisc. Even more popular was 1986's Top Gun, with dogfighting MiGs a backdrop to fighter pilot drama. It too spawned a number of video games to cash in on its name, and it likely influenced Sega's Afterburner, released in 1987. Not a particularly realistic simulator, but the impressive scaling graphics, imposing cabinet, and non-stop action made for a memorable arcade experience. The most pressing threat of the Cold War wasn't delivered by aeroplane, however, but instead a self-propelled means, able to target anywhere on the globe, and nearly impossible to intercept. Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs. A sinister side effect of developing rockets able to travel to space 
It was the Soviets who devised the first in 1957, the R-7 Semyorka. This was the same platform that launched Sputnik, but rather than reaching for the stars, its nuclear payload was aimed squarely at American shores. Naturally, this caused a bit of a stir, and the US quickly developed a similar platform in response, the SM-65 Atlas. Total annihilation anywhere on Earth, delivered in 30 minutes or less. While the space race stole the limelight, the real struggle was behind the scenes. A failure to keep pace with the Soviet's nuclear arsenal might be to cede superpower status. Ballistic calculations have been a necessity since the earliest days of artillery. The sooner you can calculate a projectile's trajectory, and thus its point of impact, the more likely you are to strike your target. Pre-calculated tables were the go-to means in the early 20th century. But as computer technology took off, their ability to rapidly crunch numbers meant that they soon played an instrumental role. Nuclear missiles are no exception, and the machines used in the 1950s to calculate their path were typically analog computers, reliant on variable voltage instead of discrete digital bits. These machines could simulate basic physical scenarios, and this ability gave yield to a very early video game example, Tennis for Two. Like an early version of Pong, the game is a two-player rendition of tennis, with the ball shuttling back and forth between the players. One of the first games ever to use a graphical display, it was created as an attraction for visitors to the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Technology designed to deliver destruction, instead co-opted for peaceful play. Swords to plowshares, doom to delight. The threat of missiles raining from the sky was present for most of the Cold War, and as nuclear arsenals swelled rapidly throughout the 1960s, their use seemed inevitable. Atari's Missile Command perfectly encapsulates this fear, with an endless onslaught of missiles headed towards an unwitting population. You are tasked with their destruction by means of interception with counter-missiles. Careful placement required to make sure all threats are blocked. Should a missile slip through your defences, one of the six cities at the bottom of the screen might be hit and permanently destroyed. Missile Command is unusual in its defensive approach, rather than the conventional shoot-em-up formula. While the mechanics are parallel, shooting becomes more about saving yourself than destroying an opponent. This is mirrored in real life with the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI program, sometimes known as Star Wars. It was an attempt to build a defensive shield against the Soviet missile threat, a means to defuse mutually assured destruction and to tilt the scales in favor of the West. The technology required was a tall order, and an impermeable shield would have required decades of research, by which time newer missiles capable of bypassing it might have left the project moot. Like with Missile Command, it was a futile effort. The missiles keep coming in ever greater numbers until all your cities are destroyed and there's naught left to save. Such is the nature of nuclear war. Tensions reached a crisis point in 1962, when the Soviets brokered a deal with Cuba to host their nuclear missiles. This placed them a mere 90 miles from Florida, and granted a distinct advantage in first strike capability. The Cuban Missile Crisis saw the world on a knife edge, and is probably the moment closest to midnight. The world on the brink of its doom. With all that nuclear war, a button press away. Thankfully, it was resolved via diplomacy. The Soviets withdrew their missiles, in exchange for the dismantlement of American missiles in Turkey and an agreement to stay out of Cuba. For all the potential of the atom, it proves impotent through stalemate. This futility is a common trait in the depiction of atomic weapons. 
providing instant obliteration at your fingertips, but inviting your opponent to deliver the same fate unto you. Such terrible weapons shape the balance of power. An opponent without an equal ability to respond, forced to capitulate, leaving an oligarchy of nuclear states left to battle for superpower status. With the prospect of a surprise decapitation, a strike rendering a nation unable to respond, the concept of second strike capability has the potential to upset the balance. A secret fleet of submarines, each capable of launching multiple nuclear missiles, and each instructed to retaliate should the enemy take action. Perhaps you could eliminate every last missile silo, but can you be sure of destroying every single submarine? Retaining the ability to strike in retaliation serves as a very potent deterrent, and renders any first strike strategy almost untenable. Almost. Mutually assured destruction is an odd sort of equilibrium. Who would dare launch the first missile? Who would dare disarm? The only viable option is to match your opponent. To do otherwise might invite the apocalypse. As technology evolves, so too will the balance of power, with neither side seeking destruction, nor prepared to back down. The power of nuclear weapons all but denies their use, but mandates an atomic quiver ready for immediate dispatch. A power so compelling, even Gandhi himself might not resist. There is an art to this political game of chicken, the deft balance needed to stay close to the edge without falling in. They call it brinksmanship. It takes nerves of steel, but you can exploit your enemy's fear to gain political concessions, treaties, disarmament, or currying public favour. However, even the strongest leadership is subject to chance, and the most terrifying thing about nuclear war might not be a deliberate act. What if someone made a mistake? In 1983, the Soviet early warning system detected the launch of an American ICBM. Retaliation was poised for immediate dispatch. It was a false alarm, a malfunction, but only the judgment of a single man prevented the counterattack. The event wasn't made public until the 1990s, but the potential for a nuclear false alarm was the subject of 1983 film War Games. It was a fusion of Cold War fear and the rising popularity of video games. A young Matthew Broderick hacks into a military computer and unwittingly starts a training exercise in the belief that it was just a game. Truly, we live in a fragile world, with Armageddon hanging by a thread, and where a single mistake invites destruction. The fate of the world subject to a slip of a button. How about a nice game of chess? An unwinnable war, a futile pursuit, the only winning move not to play the ultimate weapon at mankind's disposal, and the first of our creations that might prove our undoing. Nuclear weapons might be a currency of peace, but what a terrible price. For all the fear nuclear weapons instill, we know little of their actual effect. Testing can reveal explosive yield and the dispersion of radioactive isotopes, but the impact of nuclear war on society remains largely unknown. Duck and cover was the best advice on offer to civilians during the 1950s. There's not much else to be done in the face of a surprise attack. Safe to say, the aftermath wouldn't be pretty. Scorched flesh and demolished homes. But what about those who survive? Could society rebuild? And if so, what would life be like after the apocalypse? The first step towards survival is a well-stocked fallout shelter, an insurance policy for the American dream. 
a sturdy refuge underground, will bear the brunt of an explosion, and also provide a place to live until it's safe to emerge. Fallout is perhaps the best-loved series of games set in the post-apocalypse, and their underground vaults underpin the story. The smiling face of Vault Boy sells vault Tech's altruistic goal – to save humanity in the case of nuclear war. However, their true purpose is altogether more sinister. The vaults serve as an experiment on their human subjects, unbound by ethics and with scant regard for safety. Nevertheless, life in the vault is as comfortable as it gets for many. But the warm confinement of the womb is no place to stay. A rebirth is inevitable. An emergence. A dream shattered. A world transformed. The death toll, if it were able to be measured, would rank in the millions. Beyond the realm of tragedy, Instead, a grim statistic. In nuclear strategy, a million deaths are rolled into a rather sinister concept. Megadeath. A post-war vision of tactics not designed to avert destruction, only to mitigate it. Earth left scorched by scores of artificial suns, robbed of its warmth by a gyre of radioactive ash. The onset of a nuclear winter. A world left cold. Dead. This resultant wasteland is the stage for the post-apocalypse. Few could survive. Between searing light, toxic pollution, and the resultant chaos, life on Earth would be all but annihilated. Mass extinction, the destruction of agriculture, the collapse of ecosystems, and the entire planet left barren. Upon emerging in such a world, the living might envy the dead. It's no surprise that nuclear weapons are so feared. The destruction they could wreak is the stuff of nightmares. However, the secondary radioactive consequences are more insidious, capable of invisibly destroying life from the inside out. Nuclear material is dispersed by atomic detonation into the upper atmosphere, where the fine particles can be carried for thousands of miles by atmospheric currents before falling to Earth. Nuclear fallout can contaminate entire continents with poisonous isotopes, and exposure can lead to radiation sickness, cancer, and death. The power of the atom has some lingering side effects. Not to mention terrible PR. Nuclear power was once the herald of a new atomic age. But between bombs and fallout, it was never going to have it easy in the public eye. Accidents such as the Chernobyl disaster in 1986 were the final control rod in the sarcophagus, with a catastrophic meltdown irradiating millions resulting in countless cancer cases and directly costing the lives of at least 31 during the cleanup operation. It is the single most severe accident in the history of atomic power, soured the public perception of the entire nuclear industry for generations to come, and rendered a parcel of land with a radius of 30 kilometers unusable for the next 20,000 years. Notably, the Stalker series is set in the zone surrounding the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. A territory torn by radioactive emission and strange anomalies. This setting builds the game's atmosphere. Unrelentingly hostile, bleak, fractured. Devoid of comfort, save for a few trading bolt holes and nomadic bands of stalkers drinking vodka around a campfire. Its story drives you closer to the heart of the zone where the threat level multiplies exponentially. Bands of soldiers, grotesque mutants, and some truly terrifying hazards that can't be seen with the naked eye. The depiction of an invisible radioactive threat can be quite difficult. Its effects are not immediate, and its appearance not distinctive. Dangerous material is sometimes marked with bright color and an ominous shine. 
green like a radium glow, the bright hues of yellow cake, or an otherworldly blue seen in Cherenkov radiation. Other times it's a more subtle, unsettling effect. Static-like noise, a clinging fog, or blurred vision. Audio cues are less variable and somewhat more realistic. The soft clicking of a Geiger counter marking discrete ionization, with the pace picking up the closer you get to a radioactive source. However it's indicated, the gameplay mechanics behind radiation mirror that of real life. Bad things will happen if you suffer too much exposure, so it's generally wise to move on as quickly as possible. Such is the nature of a nuclear wasteland, a hazardous place pockmarked with poisonous scars. And yet, the environment represents only a fraction of the danger. For the denizens of the wasteland, survival means scavenging, picking clean civilization's corpse. A new frontier, a desperate world with scant relief, fertile only for humanity's worst traits. From this crucible emerges a polarized morality, those seeking to rebuild versus chaotic agents of destruction. This dichotomy is the plot basis of Stephen King's The Stand, but an exploration of righteousness and virtue is a common theme in post-apocalyptic fiction. A mirror for the biblical idea of the end times, the last judgment, the world on the brink between salvation and damnation, culminating in a final battle of good versus evil. Life in the wasteland is tough. Homesteads there are normally ramshackle, rough-hewn abodes cast together from salvaged materials. Clustered settlements form around natural resources or easily defensible positions, built in a fashion aping former civilization with shops, clinics, bars. A cruel pastiche of the old world, built on its bones. Still, there remains a will to rebuild society, and the desire to restore some aspect of civilization is often the driving force behind a story. Water, electricity, food, weapons, all such commodities command a high price, but come with commensurate risk. As a new society emerges, so too does the need to defend it. Assemble a shining city, and jealous eyes will look on from the wilderness. Man's tribal nature is not so easily tamed. As new settlements are built and groups coalesce, factions unite under banners and ideals. Some seek the glory of the old world, others wish to forge a new empire, some simply revel in chaos. With the veneer of civilization stripped away, there is a regression to a more primal state, but this new dawn is destined for an all too familiar sunset. So it goes, wandering a world in ruin is a deadly pursuit, a lonesome road, a journey. Mad Max is what happens when a road movie meets the end of the world, a ribbon of asphalt torn through a desolate land. Its traversal mirrors the hardships faced in the story, the distance travelled a reflection of a changed protagonist. The perfect avenue for a post-apocalyptic tale, the wasteland is an anvil for heroes to be forged. For a subject so dark, apocalyptic fiction seems surprisingly popular. What's the appeal in the end times? Is there a dark desire in us to see our own destruction? An end to all our problems? Or perhaps just a wish for a new beginning? Any game that explores Armageddon has to take a few liberties with reality but gently bending world events to fit fiction can paint a more believable backstory. Like slipping into another dimension, an alternate history can help explain terrifying outcomes. What if the Nazis developed nuclear weapons first? What if North Korea invaded America? 
Exploring these questions results in a radically different world, but one familiar, real, but for the grace of fate. Not every apocalypse is brought about by nuclear weapons, but when faced with a destroyed world, the details rarely matter. Sometimes it's a bacteria, a virus, or a voodoo curse. Zombies are a common theme which lead to similar circumstances. The collapse of society and a resultant struggle for survival. Invariably set amidst urban decay, ruined buildings ransacked for supplies, tribal bands of survivors wary of outsiders, and the sustained gnawing of a shambling threat. The Walking Dead are the destruction of humanity made manifest. A reminder of a selfish hunger in the hearts of all men. Similar themes of world destruction turn up in science fiction, normally where a thinly veiled superweapon serves as an analogue to the atom bomb. In Gears of War, we see the ruins of a human colony, torn asunder by orbital weapons. Cities of ash that, while familiar, belong to another solar system. The massive scale of space can magnify consequence. Nukes threaten destruction on a planetary scale, but the Reapers from Mass Effect have galactic consequences. Old mistakes in a new world. A look to the future can cast a new light on the past. The end of the world makes for a great story. True, there are few happy endings, but when you start in the midst of hell, what hope could there be? Even when faced with the greatest testament to our sins, man's nature will never yield. Destroy the world, and we'll rebuild just to do it again. It's kind of funny when you think about it. Gallows humour, with all our necks on the line. In the middle of the 1980s, the end of the Soviet Union was nigh. Decades of conflict and a stagnant economy. A change was needed, and the glasnost policies of Mikhail Gorbachev began the process. A move away from state censorship and the oppression of free speech, and a realisation that technology was starting to make the complete control of information impossible. The miniaturization and cost reduction of microprocessors paved the way for the rise of the microcomputers in the late 1970s. These cheap 8-bit machines had crude graphics and even cruder sound, but it didn't matter. For the first time, computers were becoming commonplace in homes. First found in the hands of hobbyists, the earliest micros were sold in kit form. But later products like the Apple II and Atari 8-bit range broke into mass-market appeal. Many were bought with the intent of settling home accounts or working out of the office, but invariably the most compelling feature was the games. Unlike consoles, microcomputers were programmable. With the right know-how, you had everything you needed to create your own software from scratch. An invisible cottage industry emerged passionate individuals with a love of games, and the curiosity to master this new hardware. The dawn of the bedroom programmer. Finally, the means of video game production in the hands of the people. With the widespread distribution of computers, surprisingly popular games can spring from unexpected places. The best known Soviet contribution to the interactive arts was a game developed by Alexei Pajitnov in 1984, whilst working as an artificial intelligence researcher at the Dorodnitsyn Computing Center in Moscow. Tetris is a puzzle game based on the arrangement of falling tiles, tetrominoes comprising various arrangements of four squares. The game requires that you arrange a sequence of these tiles to form contiguous rows, and upon successful assembly, the lines disappear, supplementing your score and granting more room to manoeuvre. A surprisingly addictive game emerges from these simple rules, and its early popularity led to Western publishers clamouring for its licence rights. 
Tetris was the first entertainment software to be exported from the USSR to the West. And how it was marketed is an interesting reflection of the attitude of the time. The original game was quite spartan. A text-only monochrome display, no music, nothing superfluous to the gameplay. However, in the West, the game's exotic origin was trumpeted at every turn. Festooned with a hammer and sickle, faux Cyrillic lettering, Russian imagery from cosmonauts to the Kremlin, and in the case of the Game Boy version, a particularly catchy version of a Russian folk song. It's this handheld version that helped to establish Tetris's popularity, with the game included as a long-standing pack-in with the Game Boy. It's simple yet addictive gameplay, the perfect fit for the shorter gameplay sessions of handheld play. Even today, Tetris remains a popular title, and you'd be hard-pushed to find a platform that doesn't have its own version. With near universal availability, the game from beyond the Iron Curtain defied the odds and became one of the most important games in history. From Russia with fun. As millions built with blocks in Tetris, millions more sought to tear down a divisive wall. The revolutions of 1989 spread across communist Europe, with a weakened Soviet Union ousted in favour of democracy. The close of the Iron Curtain, an autumn of nations. The USSR was formally dissolved in 1991, the event which marks the end of the Cold War. The world had seen massive change over its duration. The advent of modern computing, man's first journey to outer space, the mass adoption of television, and the cultivation of weapons of mass destruction. Not least of all, the birth of a new industry the product of a half-century of research and already an established part of popular entertainment. Video games had truly come of age. Their formative years had seen them moulded by the political events of the Cold War, and some of the conventions established then persist today. Beyond the broad themes, space, nuclear tension and the fear of annihilation, 40 years of conflict has had some subtler influences. Games are littered with Cold War cliches, even down to the simplest element. The need for an opponent leads to a distinction of two or more sides, and even the colours used evoke images of propaganda. Red versus blue. Both primary colours and both distinct. Perhaps it's just a convention that stuck. But enemies are often red, and most players will instinctively avoid them without instruction. A convenience for game designers, a trope repeated without question. The good guys shoot blue lasers, the bad guys shoot red lasers. There are very few groups who make convincing enemies without causing too much upset, and it seems as though Russians are first pick from the gallery of evil. Of course, a good bad guy must dress the part, and so military greatcoats, ushankas and hammer and sickle flags are all standard issue. A thick Russian accent is a must too, along with an enduring loyalty to the motherland. The evil Soviet stereotype can turn up anywhere, and frequently does, but is most at home within the political tension of the late 20th century. Considering the influence of the Cold War in video games, it's perhaps surprising that more games aren't set within it. Perhaps it's the lack of conventional action. Most fighting was via proxy wars, such as in Korea and Vietnam, and few such conflicts had as satisfactory an end as World War II, nor one particularly flattering to the Americans. When these theatres are depicted, the focus is normally on special forces rather than regular troops. Stories of subterfuge during secret missions. Such tales are filled with far more intrigue. Delicate operations with high stakes. Emphasising the romantic idea that the heroic few can influence the fates of many. The 90s were a dynamic time for video games. An emergence from novel diversion 
into multi-billion dollar industry. We saw technology evolve, with the first machines powerful enough to render 3D scenes in real time, dedicated GPUs, and CD-ROM storage, enabling recorded voice, soundtracks, and full motion video. As the scope of production increased, small groups of hobbyist programmers coalesced into ever larger studios. The industry blossomed in the areas that had invested most into technology education. America, Japan, Europe, and Russia. It's no coincidence that the majority of games are made in the first and second world. The 1990s officially ended with a damp squib of millennium celebration. We'd have to wait nearly two more years for the true end of an era. An uninvited awakening that served as a reminder of a fragile world. 9-11 changed everything. From fear to fascination and back again. With two monuments to America toppled, after the shock subsided, a collective lust for revenge emerged. As one war ended, another began. This time, a war on terror. And if you thought nuclear war was futile, try fighting an abstract concept. Nevertheless, America found an enemy in Iraq. Action broadcast live on 24-hour news. The world witness to an invasion. Live from the front lines. A new us versus a new them. And this time, it was personal. Terrorists entered the stable of acceptable opponents. Ushanka's shed for Kefia instead. The stage set for a new theatre. Modern warfare. The fear of a Soviet strike replaced with something even less predictable. An errant arsenal in the hands of terrorists with nothing to lose. A nuke by any other name. Weapons of mass destruction. WMDs cover a broad spectrum of threats. Nuclear, chemical or biological. United by their capacity to do harm. A small device in a densely populated area could be devastating and a strike could come anywhere, at any time. Of course, the threat of terrorism is incredibly small, perhaps not worthy of the attention paid to it. But like the elevated fear of shark attacks that followed the release of Jaws, humans are not best known for their rational behaviour. Some fears are more justified than others, and what could rouse more terror than the possibility of one's web history being made public? Governments rely on mass surveillance to curb potential terror threats, and our lives are becoming increasingly searchable online. Privacy has become a major political issue. Such themes have become quite common in video games, as surveillance cameras and hacking lend themselves well to gameplay. Cameras can work both ways, particularly in stealth games. Avoiding their slow-moving cone of vision to avoid detection, or accessing a security console to gain insight of threats that lie ahead. Hacking is something which is almost never depicted accurately, and games are no exception, normally using the activity as an excuse to add a puzzle-based minigame. Still, these mechanics can help diversify playstyles, an element of strategy in games which may otherwise be dominated by brawn, and in some cases can serve as a social commentary on the potential risks of unwarranted surveillance. Some technological threats lurk menacingly on the horizon, yet to come to fruition. The idea of a rogue artificial intelligence has been a long present facet of fiction. From HAL 9000 to the Terminator, there exists a wariness of killer machines. Perhaps it's not surprising then that some reservations have been expressed about the combat use of autonomous drones loaded with missiles. For now, these platforms are governed by a human operator, but even remote-controlled weapons platforms are not free of ethical dilemma. It's no doubt safer for the pilots to be removed from the action, but killing by proxy almost seems unsporting. Nice. More troubling is the expansion of such weapons' autonomy. Should a machine be allowed to make its own assessment of targets, 
would it ever be wise to grant full fire control to an algorithm? Perhaps it's an unfounded fear based on decades of science fiction. But AI has no problems beating humans at chess. And war might not be much different. If knowledge is power, then technology is its weapon. From longbows at Agincourt to the machine guns, tanks and aircraft of the 20th century, technology and war are inseparably intertwined. A chain reaction ignited by our greatest hopes and darkest fears. The information age was built on Cold War technology, and culture, like war, has a thirst for communication. The rise of television has kept us fed with a stream of news. Now, major political events resonate louder than ever, with works of fiction exploring the fear and consequences of real-world actions. Video games are not exempt. Games which explore the topic of war are commonplace, and some of the most popular titles in recent years are a mirror image of recent conflicts. When the computing technology that drives them has roots in military research, the link might be uncomfortably close for some. To condemn war is not to condemn video games. For all their violent imagery, they are just a reflection of reality. Games appeal to mankind's competitive nature. A chance to tell a hero's tale of valour or to serve as a warning of humanity's folly. You gotta extract him. War might yield a terrible crop. Death, destruction, terror. But even from these bitter roots, something wonderful can emerge. A product of war, but for the purpose of peace. An unintended harvest. A nuclear fruit. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, farewell.